All right, this is the second video all about uh, ecology and what that's all about. Uh, last time we were just talking about really kind of the reasons behind uh, why ecology is important and also how it connects to all the other things we've been doing uh, throughout Science 9. And so here I want to try to get into more of the the modeling, the, th the thing that kind of sums up where all of our ideas are coming from, what the, the reliance of the model uh, comes from kind of a specific thing, and uh, specifically flow of energy. This is really key to everything. And we've, we've talked about flow of energy before, and I just want to remind everyone a few things. For example, like where does flow of energy come from? And it, it, it generally comes from what could be kind of put into one word, imbalance uh, we see this all the time uh, for example if I have hot and a cold object uh, side by side I will have a flow of thermal energy from hot to cold uh, if I have uh, high potential energy high potential energy I will always see a flow of say electrons from high to low potential energy uh, like we see in a circuit and this is only caused if I have an imbalance if I had uh, two sides of my battery at the same potential energy there would be no circuit um, I could also think in terms of pressure uh, the whole reason why you breathe the reason why you breathe is because you um, you may not realize this whoops is that well, let's talk about that for a second low pressure the whole reason you, you, you breathe, let's just think about that, is that you have lungs. Here's our little lungs. Whee! And then you basically, uh, when you expand them by making them larger volumes, that suddenly creates a change in pressure from the outside air, outside air, and the inside air. And as a result, uh, since this uh, pressure is now because it's all spread out more I have less density of all the atoms of air inside my lungs I therefore have a lower pressure and therefore air will rush in to my lungs because I always go from high pressure to low pressure it's one of those interesting things that we don't think about because most people when they think about breathing think it has something to do with some kind of I don't know sucking mechanism inside of our lungs and it's not the case all we're doing is changing pressure levels uh, naturally with our body and therefore causing a imbalance an imbalance of two things and therefore a flow of energy as a result so flow of energy really comes from this idea of imbalance it's it's key to what we're talking about and so everything about the earth is involving a transformation or a uh, movement flow of energy across its surface and this is where we're getting our life from so what is initially causing that we're going to get into that uh, very shortly let's just uh, remain remind ourselves what I had said in the last video and this is uh, that ecology is trying to model the entire ecosystem and that will include two factors uh, biotic factors and abiotic factors and that is quite simply as shown here that we have things that are not living in other words things that are just purely uh, made of their chemical constant, uh, constituents but they're not necessarily what we would call alive so things like grass and the little kitty there they would be considered alive for a variety of reasons I'm not going to get into the details that that have biologists determining whether something is alive or not because that's actually one hell of a discussion on its own so really all we're just simply saying is that we're trying to include everything that's the only way to get a true ecological model is that I need to include everything. So let's get into it a little bit. In order to really understand it, we also have to deal with uh, several uh, processes that are considered cyclic. And some of these you've already done. You already know about these. So when I say cyclic, what I mean is we have something that repeats. Uh, you there's there's a few words for that sometimes you might hear the word periodic um, but cyclic still works the same way we're just simply saying that in some sense the all of these things I'm going to describe here are start at some point they go through a process in which they end up back where they started 
That's really all I'm talking about. And uh, this happens all over the place uh, in the atmosphere, which is really just simply all of the air and other uh, gaseous uh, elements that are above us. Uh, and then we have the geosphere, which is all the, the rocky bits, <laughs> the earth below us. The hydrosphere, of course, referring to our oceans and rivers. And the biosphere, which is um, the thing that really gets things a lot more complicated uh, due to their, uh, the strange interactions they may have with each other. Uh, this including, of course, all the plants, as well as all the animals and living creatures uh, that exist on Earth. So all of these will involve some level of imbalance and flow of energy. All of them. And so the question is, is really, well, let's just get into it here. Uh, for anything to do anything, we need energy. And, but, but once again, like I said, it's not just the energy we need. We need an imbalance of energy. We need to flow. So how are these things all getting flowed and moved around? Well, we would refer back to these things. These would have a lot to do with how energy is flowing around. Uh, but wait a minute. Where is the energy coming from in the first place? Where are we getting all this energy? And uh, we've already talked about this. The answer is pretty simple. Uh, the sun. We're getting the energy all from our sun. This is, this is the sole source of all our energy on Earth. Uh, it is what we depend upon. Without the Earth, we, uh, sorry, without the sun, we would be a sad little cold ball in space with not, probably nothing alive on it. Um, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible to have life. Uh, that's not clear at all. We we have hopes that some planets that are far away from the sun, for example, some of the moons around Jupiter and whatnot, may still be able to sustain life, but they would still need energy of some sort. And in that case, they're looking at geothermal energy, energy deep down in the center of their planets or planetoids uh, that are producing heat. And therefore, once again, a difference in temperature from one place to the next and therefore a flow. So every time I'm talking about this, I'm talking about flow. But let's get down to the sun. Let's talk about the sun. So I've got myself... Whoops. I'm going to get rid of that. Boom. Oh, there we go. That's what I want to see. Let's move this... I'm going to move the, the earth a little further down. Let me see. Yeah, that's good. And so we're going we're gonna to try to draw this out here. Let's just draw the sun. Whee! There's the sun. And the sun is basically sending a whole pile of both uh, solar and thermal energy towards... Whoops, I keep doing that, don't I? I'm sorry about that. Thermal energy towards the Earth. Now, let's just get down to the Earth before we get into this. Um, let me get another pitch. Let's, let's do a different color. Let's try blue. And... Um, in order to really get into this, we have to include the fact that there is an atmosphere around... Shoot, I keep doing that. Uh, we have an atmosphere. And this is also, let's let's just simply say we're going to have a certain area. I'm calling them, I'm, I'm showing them as clouds, but uh, they, I'm, they're not necessary clouds. You, you might not even be able to see some of these things. But what we're interested in, in is a layer of stuff that we will now call uh, greenhouse gra ga bleh, greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, they become pretty important, significantly important with what's been going on lately. So greenhouse gases, what am I talking about? Well, I'm including things such as uh, water vapor, uh, basically just H2O. H2O hanging out in a gaseous state up in the atmosphere. I am talking about carbon dioxide. I am talking about methane. And methane is one carbon and four hydrogens. And then I'm talking about uh, a little bit of nitrous oxide. So these are kind of the big ones that we're interested in. This is when we talk about greenhouse gases. These are the things we're um, most interested in. Uh, this is the one that is currently giving us a whole pile of problems uh, because of how much it is. Now, I'm going to talk about how 
the greenhouse gases at a certain layer are doing something to how we get or not get our energy from the sun. So they, this becomes a pretty important part of what we're going to talk about. So let's, when the energy comes down, we're going to be dealing with quite a few different situations. For example, the energy becomes coming down, la 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 la, and as a result of the atmosphere and those greenhouse gases, it bounces off. So a, a portion, a portion, uh, bounces off. In other words, we don't even get it. We don't even get that energy. Bounces off of atmosphere. And this is actually pretty important because what we're looking at here is we are regulating. This is very important. We don't want all the energy. If we had all the energy coming up to us, we would actually end up heating up the earth at a terrific pace and we don't want that so we do actually want a certain portion of the sun's energy to bounce off in fact what we like is that not just some of the energy but specific parts of the energy in other words there's there's parts of the sun's energy there's a, there's a wide range of wavelengths of energy and when I say wavelengths of energy keep in mind when I'm talking about that I'm saying that light comes at us in uh, visible light uh, infrared light, radio waves. This all comes from the sun, every single wavelength. But at the same time, we also get things like x-rays, uh, ultraviolet, and even a tiny bit of gamma. Uh, gamma energy comes from the sun, and these we don't want to hit us. They will actually cause horrible things to happen to us. And so as a result, the atmosphere, thankfully, uh, diverts or bounces off a lot of these dangerous uh, wavelengths of light uh, due to the size of their wavelength. And so what we would call high energy um, light actually goes away. So not only is it a regulation, but it's also keeping us uh, regulation and I don't know what would be the word and, and, and keeping us, keeping us alive. So we, we could include that as part of the reason why things get bounced. Now, uh, what else happens? Well, we also want to have some thermal energy that comes in, gets through. Now, I, I'm drawing it as a straight line. I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, to be honest, really, once you go through the atmosphere, it gets scattered and bounced. So I'm going to show it a little bouncy bounce. And because the atmosphere, you got to think about it, light is going to start hitting all those molecules of air. It's going to get bounced around. Uh, there's actually an entire uh, set of physics dedicated to talking about this. Uh, there's a fascinating phenomenon called Raleigh scattering, which talks about why we only see blue light. Do you notice that the sky is blue? Why is it? It has a lot to do with how things get scattered at this level in the atmosphere. Why are we only seeing the blue light? Uh, I'm not going to get into it here, but it is kind of neat. So some of the uh, some of the light will come down and gets absorbed into the Earth. So the Earth itself, in other words, the ground uh, takes in some of that. Takes in some of that. Uh, very important. Very important. So we're we're heating up some of the, some of the Earth with that. That's great. We're getting some of that heat energy, some thermal energy into our land mass. Uh, we could uh, actually showed it hitting. I didn't. It didn't hit land there, did it? I made it hit the ocean, which is a different thing. So let's just talk about that too. We could have this come down. Let's say it bounced this more, and then it went into the ocean current. So we're going to call this this. We could have some of it hit our ocean, and then it gets flowed around. And we're going to talk about that in more detail another time. But it gets flowed around the Earth by simply the movement of the water. Now that's uh, movements according to wave patterns which are due to wind or uh, what we call convection currents which is the natural movement of water because of temperature differentials. If there's a difference in temperature, once again, what did I say? That's an imbalance. So once again, we're having movement of the water due to because due to one part of the water being cold and one part of the water being hot and therefore we have movement so this heat energy coming from the sun gets immediately distributed throughout the earth due to these ocean currents uh what else we're gonna have it come down 
and then it's going to hit the air and then it's going to flow along here. So now we're going to have uh, wind currents taking some of that around. And once again, why do we have wind? Why do we have wind? Well, that's because the air is moving. Why is the air moving? Well, there's two main reasons. And once again, we'll talk about that more later. But the, the big one is, once again, temperature differentials. It's, it's hotter on one side. It's colder on the other side. Now I have movement of air. But on top of that, also, I have the fact that the Earth is spinning, which is producing a bit of a drag effect on the atmosphere. Like the Earth is spinning, but the, uh, the air kind of keeps up with it, but kind of gets dragged a little. And because of that, we have this kind of swirling thing called the Coriolis effect. I'll get into it more later, so uh, don't worry about that. Just have a note on that. Uh, so I've got ocean currents and wind currents. And just remember, this is, uh, just to talk about here, this is due to imbalance imbalance uh, of temperature mostly I'm talking about temperature here uh, which is causing movement so this is this moves moves heat but not just that because the air isn't just air ocean is not just ocean it's not just moving heat it's moving all the stuff that's in it which means I'm also moving heat plus let's call them nutrients but basically good stuff for things to have Imagine this. Imagine if the, the Earth just simply, the sun came down, hit one spot and one spot only, and all the energy was on this one little, like, mountain top. Uh, and, and everything that was on the Earth, if it wanted energy, had to go get it. How much stuff do you think would be alive on the Earth if that was the case? Not much. We, we have everything to thank for the fact that things are moving around, constantly swirling around on the Earth providing all parts of the earth with some level of energy that can be taken in. So, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Now, I, I've, I've not talked about one other thing here. I'm going to change my color because, of course, I want green. Because why do I want to talk about green? Because there's one big thing that I haven't talked about, which is really, yay, look at the trees. Because we are covered with trees. We are, the, the, the earth is covered. covered oh, these are horrible trees here. A little, little bouncy one there. Yay, bouncy tree. And, okay, I got a bunch of trees. Why, why am I talking about that? Because a whole bunch of the sun comes down and whoosh, now it's getting absorbed by trees. So let's just simply say this is absorbed. But that's not the big thing. It is not just simply absorbed. We have two things happening here. Uh, when sunlight is captured by trees, it is undergoing what's called photo. You probably know this already photosynthesis but at the same time we have two processes happening at the same time and this one would be cellular well, I'm gonna need a lot of room for this one respiration to whoop, you stop that respiration so when I talk about a plant taking in energy from the Sun what it's also doing is that it is uh, making, uh, making biomass. Biomass just means living stuff with some um, like amount of it. Um, trees get bigger. How are they doing that? They're getting the energy from the sun and they're grabbing other chemicals from the earth and they're growing more of themselves. And then things eat them and then they live. And so the heart of all the things that we eat to survive is based upon the fact that plants take energy from the sun. That is the root of it all. So photosynthesis and cellular respiration is a really, really important thing that we have to deal with. By the way, there's a lot of construction going on outside my house. So if you hear a lot of beep, beep, beeping or anything like that, my apologies. Now, that's almost everything. I'm going to talk about photosynthesis and cellular respiration in great detail. But there is one other thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it another color. That's because this one's the tricky one. This is the one that's giving us a, a great big headache. It's colored a beautiful red. It's because we do have uh, one problematic situation, and that's because uh, there has been a large increase of uh, this stuff in the atmosphere. In other words, we've increased the amount of greenhouse gases uh, recently. Uh, well, and by recently, I mean in the last 100, 200 years. And this increase, uh, particularly in CO2 in the atmosphere, because we like to burn the things that have all the carbon captured. Um, maybe I should get into that a little bit. 
Let's talk about that for a moment. Where, what exactly is where is this come? Where is this thing coming from? Uh, so, a uh, long time ago, uh, before there were, let's say, creatures uh, such as, and specifically, things like worms, detritus, uh, creatures that ate dead stuff. Uh, we don't really think about this, but dead eating things that eat dead stuff and turn them back into chemicals and nutrients that other things can use is so important. Now imagine, if you will, way back a long time ago, millions and millions of years, hundreds of millions of years ago, uh, the earth, when it started out on land, uh, the first things that were on the land were not creatures, but rather plants. In other words, enormous forests. When these forests were growing up and occasionally falling over, when they died and fell over, now you know what happens to uh, a pile of wood that falls over in the forest. It rots. It rots. It falls apart and rots and gets broken down. Now, why is it doing that? Well, it's not doing that because it feels like it. It doesn't do it because that's naturally part of the process. Once the thing's dead and nothing's alive in it, it has no reason to do anything more. The fact is, is that there's creatures and things in the environment that actually break down stuff to turn it back into things that could be used again. But at the beginning of the time of the Earth, this stuff wasn't around. Nothing was breaking it down. So, if you will, you can picture millions and millions of years ago, you had a ton of forests covering the Earth and then falling over and then not going away. Picture that, not going away. Just a big pile of broken down forest and then stuff growing around them for, for a very, very long time. There's an enormous uh, pile of stuff in the, uh, uh, the layers of rock underneath us that is made up of all this stuff. Now, a lot of this, uh, we tend to talk about fossil fuels being coming from fossils in other words fossils of like dinosaurs and stuff but a lot of it also is because of the living stuff such as plant life and and a lot of this comes from this point that we just got this huge layer of wood and and forests that had fallen down and due to photosynthesis just so it's clear photosynthesis and cellular resp respiration involve the capturing of carbon from the atmosphere and trees have this wonderful little effect that what they do is they take carbon from the atmosphere and push back out oxygen. Yay for us, because that's what actually made the Earth livable for things like you and me. Uh, before that, we probably wouldn't have been able to do anything on Earth because it wasn't really a livable atmosphere. But thanks to the green life that was basically taking the solar energy, transforming it into biomass, producing oxygen and capturing carbon we got ourselves the atmosphere we have now now as a result uh that all got buried and a significant amount of the carbon that was in the atmosphere was gone but then of course a while ago uh somebody started burning stuff and said isn't that neat i'm getting a whole bunch of energy that was captured inside this log or this piece of coal or this oil and so we started burning everything going yay we got all this really easy accessible energy that we just have to dig up out of the ground and then nothing wrong with that right guys yay and we started burning everything now as a result <laughs> sorry to say that as we started burning all this we started bringing back all the carbon back into the atmosphere particularly into the form of carbon dioxide so we've been returning all the carbon that were there before for the trees captured it all and sending it back into the atmosphere uh, so do yourself a favor and plant more trees we really want them to do their job a lot more than what they're doing we need more trees uh, because the other thing that's happening now here's the big problem is that not only do we have more greenhouse gases now in particular co2 in the atmosphere it is doing a funny thing because like i said some portion bounces off the atmosphere but some of the light comes down and doesn't get absorbed like I showed here, but actually bounces. Now, this would also normally be something that goes like this out, just like this. It's part of the regulating. It doesn't actually bounce off the atmosphere, but bounces off the Earth and then goes through the greenhouse gases back into space. And once again, that's another way of regulating our temperature. 
But what's happening is that, no, there's more CO2 here, so therefore, oh, it's bounced back. Oh, it's bouncing around. Oh, it's sticking around. And as a result, it's starting to heat up the Earth. Our temperature is changing as a result of this. The fact that we have now happily burned a whole bunch of stuff, released a whole bunch of carbon back into the uh, Earth's atmosphere. This is producing a lot of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas that is now reflecting the bouncy, bouncy light back onto the Earth and therefore keeping the heat energy into the Earth's system. So we're getting an increase in temperature, and this is what we are saying is eh, maybe not the best of things. Maybe not. Uh, we're, we can talk about that another time, but I mean, we're looking at a situation where the, uh, let's say a fragile balance of all the things going on on the earth is being deeply affected by our activity. And so we really do have to take pause and say, maybe we need to get some of that carbon back out of the atmosphere. The trees aren't doing their job. Well, they're doing a great job. What am I saying? The trees are doing an amazing job. But we are not helping things by saying, here, uh, let's, let's send out more than you can even handle. So that's basically the situation with the, uh, the sun. Um, I think that covers everything I want to talk about. So what we'll talk about next then is exactly how say things like the wind currents and the ocean currents and photosynthesis work we'll talk about that stuff but i think that's good enough for now We're, we've covered a kind of an interesting thing here there's lots of things to talk about uh, i highly suggest that you do a little research on some of these things uh, or look at the next videos and i'll cover some of them again anyway that should be it